Good morning. We're here uh, today to talk to you about the invaluable contribution uh, made by the late great Hilda Hallen Mason to the city of Washington and to the country as a whole. For many, many decades, she was a leader in the civil rights movement, the environmental movement, the anti-nuclear movement, you name the movement, and she was there. I don't think in my long life that I have ever met anyone who was as, in, as interested and involved in as many disparate causes as this woman was. My name is Debbie Hanrahan, and I'm here this morning to talk to Lawrence Giot, who was a very good friend and compatriot with Hilda Mason for many, many years. Uh, before he begins to talk, I want to tell you a little bit about him, because we're also very honored to have him with us. Uh, he was one of the major figures in the 1960s civil rights movement. He was a native of Mississippi, that's right, and, and one of the original members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating uh, Committee. In 1964, he directed the historic Freedom Summer Project in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, that was a project to register voters who had been denied uh, the right to vote. <coughs> and then the very same year, he was elected chairman of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was the um, group that was challenging the uh, Democratic Party's delegation from Mississippi that was going to the Democratic National Committee meeting in Atlantic City. Is that right? That's, That's right. right. It was this unheard of, imaginative, creative uh, challenge that nobody knew what to do with, actually. Um, but Lawrence himself was unable to go to the convention. Not that he didn't want to go, but he couldn't go because he, again, I, he had been jailed yet again for his activities, his civil rights activities in Mississippi. Um, he has lived in D.C. for 40 years. He's been a political leader, an ANC commissioner, author of the Civil Rights Movement Guide for K-12 uh, classrooms, and, and much, much more. But before I introduce him, I want to read from a book that Taylor Branch wrote about what happened to the man sitting next to me uh, when he was jailed in, uh, let's see, it was Hattie's, let's see, where was it? Hattiesburg. Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Okay. <coughs> uh, he was jailed during the civil rights struggle often and was very violently treated by the police and jailers, especially in Winona, Mississippi, where he and three other jailed civil rights workers, including Fannie Lou Hamer, were described thusly in Taylor Branch's book, Pillar of Fire. When they were released from jail, they were a mess of untreated injuries, broken teeth, broken bones, back bruises covered over with leather hard skin because they had been systematically chore-like pummeled with blackjacks. And so this is, uh, when I talk about his activities and his um, interests, it wasn't just a, a part-time thing. It was a it was a choice that he made that threatened his life many, many times. And as I say, he was a big compatriot of Hilda Mason's. So now I would like to um, ask Lawrence Giat, good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you will tell me uh, how you met Hilda Mason and um, uh, how your uh, relationship with her began. I met Hilda Mason at a SNCC meeting in 1963. <coughs> she was brought there by a guy named Marion Barry. <laughs> Uh, she, who, she was introduced to the entire SNCC staff, and we then began to know each other. I later came to know her much better on, on a couple of occasions. One, we were having some arrest in Mississippi, and Elizabeth Levy said, well, let's call Charlie and, and, and Hill. They'll take care of the, the bond money. Then we, Fannie Lou Hamer, caused an election in Sunflower County to be overturned. And again, Elizabeth Levy said, let's call Charlie in to help us raise money for this special election. I am then come to Washington, and I, I've been invited to speak at uh, uh, the church, her church. And the minister tells me that they've heard too much about this Freedom Democratic Party. It's much too radical. And he, I can't speak in that church. Well, Hilda stood up, and she said, if he doesn't speak, Charlie and I are leaving this church. We're taking our money with us. The minister said, Mr. Guyon, how long do you think you'll take? <laughs> That's great. I said, right. And what I, what I especially love about that was 
There was no planning of this. I didn't know it was going to happen. She didn't know it was going to happen. Yeah. But she never hesitated in mm -hmm. standing up in that situation. Right. Now, now they, I, she and I've testified before committees of the city council, and she has brought this up. So I think maybe we can find some tape about that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very safe to say that as we remember, from 1964 up through 68, there was a movement away from civil rights into politics. I'm very comfortable in saying that there's no one who better embodies an honest transfer of the values of the civil rights movement. It's being inclusionary about issues, about empowerment of other people into electoral politics than Hilda Mason. Mm -hmm. uh, I am very pleased to have known her. And I, most of what I was able to accomplish, she was supportive of. Whenever I gave a fundraiser at my house for a candidate, she came and made a contribution. Whenever uh, I could depend on her, as I think anyone on the left right. could depend on Hilda to either be supportive or to explain to you very directly and honestly why she wasn't. I think I'm very comfortable in saying that, but for Hilda and Charlie, uh, the Dave Clark School of Law would not exist. Yes. I remember when Dave Clark was dying, there was a big push to push him off the city council. After all, we needed a, a new chairman, right? And I went down and I testified. I said, look, this is an honorable man. He's worked with SNCC. He's, worked, he's, he's given his life to the people. Let him alone. Mm -hmm. The push was re retire. Well, he couldn't afford to retire. Yeah. Okay. Right. And the only other member on the city council who supported on, me on mm -hmm. that was Hilda Mason. Yeah. Those are the kind of things you just never forget. Right. Let me jump jump in here for a second uh -huh. and say that as Hilda was getting older and and more enfeebled, um, I questioned her husband Charlie Mason about her running again, mm -hmm. and he said that they had decided she had to run again, not because she wanted to, but because she wanted to protect the existence of the law school, which at that time was being pummeled by the Washington Post. It's too expensive. The other members of the city council said, we can't afford this million one or whatever the annual budget was. And they protected it. And then, and then Lawrence, I want you to go back, but I just want to read something about the UDC Law School today with Hilda and Charlie Mason. Mm -hmm. I think Without whom, there's no question, there would have been no law school. Law there, school. It would have been totally impossible. That's right. Okay, today the David A. Clark School of Law ranks 10 among 188 ABA accredited law schools in the nation. I mean, that is just, I mean, our little, our little law school is just way up there. Um, it has 51% of its students come from minority groups, and 64% of those students now are women. The Princeton Review has rated it first in the nation for most progressive students. And I think, and I personally think that is just wonderful. I mean, mostly, usually law students are very conservative, right? These, yeah. the, that's, the, these law students represent indigents, mm -hmm. prevent people from having their houses foreclosed. They're really about, uh, there's a legal education there that, that really is tied to service. And of course, you, when you get the credentials, you can then move on and do anything else you want. Right. But I'm very proud of it. Right. And it, in fact, the, the diploma is dependent on hundreds, if not thousands of hours of community service to the poor in the district. And then like 40 hours of community service, which doesn't have to be legally uh, uh, tied. But uh, and also, um, contrary to one of the popular views about the law school, our graduates now are passing the bar the first time around. Uh, the figure that I have is that 60% pass it the first time around, which is, uh, again, nationally very uh, acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think wherever Hilda and Charlie are, they would love those statistics. They would just love those statistics. Uh, it is difficult to get into today. I mean, it's a, it's a prestigious law school. And this is the very same law school that Hilda and Charlie had to protect like a child. And um, they had the vision and the tenacity, the ta tenacity. I mean, everybody says, you know, well, Charlie had a lot of money. A lot of people have a lot of money. 
but Charlie Mason had money and tenacity and his secret weapon, which was Hilda. Again, it yeah. comes back to their values were about the empowerment of others. Yeah. yeah. They, they, their position was, what can we do to instill this thing that we've committed our, our lives right. to? How do we get other people involved in this? And uh, I don't think either one of them needed a law school for their own purposes. <laughs> no. They no. were about, no, how do you... Right. But once they latched on to this idea, uh, there's no question that without them, yeah. that law school would not exist no. today. And, and uh, I was telling Lawrence earlier before we began the program, the two people that I know who are applying to the law school for next year's admission are two of the best organizers in D.C. I mean, they're the perfect people that Charlie and Hilda had in mind mm -hmm. for giving them the further credentials so that they'd be be more effective in their organizing. That's right. Um, uh, tell me a little bit about um, uh, when you went when you were speaking at uh, All Souls. Um, didn't Hilda said Charlie and and Hilda Mason pledged so much, and then other people matched it or something, so that you went back to Mississippi with a fair amount of cash? She look. She she handled it this way. She said, no, "Well, if he doesn't speak, I'm Charlie and I are leaving this church with our money." And then the minister said, well, wh how much time will you take? And then yeah. she said to me while, after, while I was speaking, she said, well, aren't you going to ask for some money for the Freedom Democratic Party? For God's sakes. Uh, and you. and I, I, of I, of course, eagerly complied. <laughs> and she made the first contribution, and then the others were added to yeah. it. Do you remember uh, how much you took home? I think I took home around $4,000, yeah. which was a lot of money yes. for, yeah. for that movement. And, yes, I'm glad you reminded me of yeah. that. Now, how much did it cost to bail somebody out of jail, a civil rights worker? Uh, about? $100, maybe $200. But usually there were quite a few of us at, at the same time. Yeah, so it was, it was a fair amount of change. Yes. And H Hilda and Charlie supplied some of that money. Oh, there's no question. They, they, they could be counted on. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, see, I didn't know them well enough to ask them for money, mm -hmm. but Elizabeth Levy did. Mm -hmm. And. Mm -hmm. Just about everything we did in Mississippi, they financed it in some way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, in general, um, I, my own personal experience is that um, if you were, if your back was to the wall and you were working on a project that you felt was really important, and so, and if they thought it was important, you could go to them, and they would save your life financially. I mean, it was such a terrific safety net, and so many things in the city happened because they stepped into the breach let, 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 and let, got you through. What, a good example of that, and it didn't, didn't really take too much money, but it took uh -huh. a willingness to invest in the future. Without her working with a guy named Kastemeyer, we wouldn't have the ANCs in this city. Interesting. That was one of her products. Yeah. That was yeah. one, and, and she, of course, sold it, and now it's, it's part of the land, and, the political land. And bedeviling the D.C. City Council. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, I, I want to go back to the <coughs> early days um, when I first met Hilda, and I was maybe a young woman of 30 or something. And um, I was privileged to meet Hilda Mason, Josephine Butler, and Julius Hobson, mm -hmm. who were all uh, founders of the D.C. Statehood Party mm -hmm. and were the um, really conscience, I think, of the city's political establishment. Mm -hmm. um, if they disagreed with you, you probably knew you were on the wrong side of the issue. You might not change, but you knew that they usually took the high road and you might not be taking the high road. Um, that party, of course, has morphed into the D.C. Statehood Green Party. Uh, and um, Hilda uh, uh, was very involved in the Statehood Constitutional Convention. Yes. And she was very involved in the bottle bill, which was killed by the bottle industry. Mm -hmm. And she was also very involved in the anti-nuke um, uh, initiative. And also, she, I think, introduced the bill that stops nuclear uh, material from going through the city. Is that, right. Was she the yes. uh, introducer of that? Yes. And I believe it passed, I'm sure. But the but the feds were very unhappy with that and uh, uh, well, and, yeah. and stuff was passing close by I think the House of Con Houses of Congress and they yeah. didn't know it uh, I and she and she revealed that I think with Friends of the Earth uh -huh. so we're talking about a Renaissance woman um, oh I, I did want to mention this and 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 maybe Lawrence can give me some fill in on this because the trajectory of Hilda Mason's life is just extraordinary she 
grew up in this little town, little county, Campbell County, Virginia. Her, her mom was a teacher. Her dad was a small businessman. But he was, they were both leaders mm -hmm. in their little town. Mm -hmm. She has a failed marriage, comes to Washington with two little baby girls, mm -hmm. becomes a domestic worker, and, but in the meantime goes to high, uh, college and gets a degree to be a teacher. Yes. Then later she gets a master's degree and becomes a teacher, a counselor, a vice principal, uh, runs for the D.C. school board and wins. And then, and then when Julius Hobson died, she filled in his seat and then she ran again and on her own right was a member of the council. But before that, she and Charlie are very, very, very much involved in the politics of education. Mm -hmm. That's how they meet. Ah, I didn't know that. Well, tell, tell us that. I, it, I don't it, know it was, about that. I asked one and she said, well, we were both involved in the politics of education. We got to know each other and then mm -hmm. we later on married. And that, the rest is history. That's and right. it was a great, great partnership. <laughs> You know, you, you've mentioned the political party that she belonged to, but Hilda was beyond political party. I, I was attending yeah. a meeting. Spoken like a true Democrat, Lawrence. I've I spoken. <laughs> uh, we, we, we Democrats can't be beneficent, yeah. but no, right. but okay. no right. seriously. Uh, I was attending a meeting of the State Executive Committee of the Democratic Party here, chaired by then Ivanhoe Donaldson. Oh, yes. And he said, well, we're going to support these candidates. They're all Democrats. And he said, we're going to support two candidates who support the platform of the National Democratic Party. And before he named them, and I knew that they were Hilda Mason and Josephine Butler. Oh, fabulous. So, so oh. they had the opportunities because of the fact that they tied their community politics into everything that they did, that they didn't have to, they could not be and would not be labeled. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, uh, they were, uh, uh, I don't know, Hilda called herself the grandmother to the world. Yes. And uh, it's, maybe it's... Uh, and no one challenged her. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I want to read this quote that um, was taken from something that Hilda wrote in a letter to someone in response to the question of, how do you keep this up? How do you, even as you get older, how, why are you still involved in these things? I mean, you could, you're comfortably off financially. You don't have to do these sorts of things. It's a pain in the neck. What are you doing? And she said, it's in the marrow of my bones. It is in my blood. Almost every step I take, I feel that I'm doing what my mother and father would have done. And my grandson, Nestor, I feel like I'm walking in his footsteps, too. This is a grandson who died, yes. tragically. I can't forget where I came from. I can't forget what my parents did to preserve their own lives. Though I'm living comfortably now, I'm not going to forget how it once was for me. And I'm not going to turn my back on people who aren't as fortunate as I am. And I want to ask Lawrence to comment on this thing that so often people will be told, I remember myself being told this, you know, being an activist is okay, but that's a 420-something. You know, now you're 30 or 40. Get serious. You know, get on with your career. Hill. <laughs> yeah, right, and they were very little. Right. Um, I was always taken by Hilda's long-term um, commitment to so many of her issues. She didn't just have a an issue and then shuck it and then go for the the commit you know the the cause of the year she carried all of her <coughs> interests and commitments through her entire life she uh, never outgrew them so to speak and so I, I was always very interested and somebody asked her how she did it how how she physically and emotionally was able to sustain all of the efforts that she was behind and this is what she said in response it's in the marrow of my bones it is in my blood Almost every step I take, I feel like I'm doing what my mother and father would have done. And my grandson, Nestor. I feel like I'm walking in his footsteps, too. I can't forget where I came from. I can't forget what my parents did to preserve their own lives. Although I'm living comfortably now, I'm not going to forget how it once was for me. And I'm not going to turn my back on people who aren't as fortunate as I am. You know, the interesting thing about Hilda was... Hilda made contributions to people and organizations throughout this city. I don't think there's ever been any indication 
that she expected anything in return for that other than that they do what they raise the money for. Right. Hilda right. comes from the old school. Hilda, Hilda, Hilda reminds me of Ella Baker. Mm -hmm. They both had adults in their lives who were service-oriented. Mm -hmm. So they got a chance to see that at hand, mm -hmm. at, up, up close. And it just stuck with Hilda. Hilda age was totally irrelevant mm -hmm. to Hilda. There was mm -hmm. people to get free and mm -hmm. things to be done. And I can understand how she and Charlie would feel that we've got to save the law school. Had they not felt that way, it wouldn't have been saved. No, no. And, and people would have relished its demise because it was costing a million dollars a year. So, so the money was tight. That's right. Yeah. So Mayor Williams wasn't the first one who came up with an idea of let's do something other than a college there. Yeah. He yeah. was simply a later... Let's, he wanted to move it to right. southeast, remember. So, right. no, I, it, it, and I, but I can't think of a better tribute to the two of them mm -hmm. than that law school and, and their reputation. They, they stand as the model for both philanthropy mm -hmm. and for really having a, 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 a political career that is without caveat. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah. they they made the move from the civil rights movement into electoral politics better than anyone. Right. That, it, that is a great point. I um, So in addition to her generosity, she was also very astute in her, her political activities. She never fell into pitfalls. She never got bamboozled. She was, very, she, she was like an old school mom. You couldn't fool her. You see, couldn't entice her into... Uh, see, one of the things that, 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 that kept her... On, a, on an excellent political uh, mm. direction was she understood that her, her and Charlie's responsibility was to empower as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. She never looked at herself as an alternative to people. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. was an agent for the people's right. empowerment. Right. She was a teacher. She was a teacher. I mean, when I worked for her, I swear to God, I felt like I was back in elementary school, and she would look at me really sternly when I screwed up. And um, I, it was, it was, it was once a school teacher, once a school counselor, always a school teacher. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in some cases, people who were even older than she was felt they, you know, sat up a little bit straighter when she was around. Um, I, I have to um, uh, mention this. Hilda was a lovely, she loved clothes and she dressed very well. Mm -hmm. But she, I never knew when she went shopping. And it turned out that a couple of times, like a year, she would go to Garfinkel's up the street and buy like a half a year's worth of clothes in a half an hour and then come back. And she was always beautifully turned out. And so she could talk to um, the hoi polloi in the city as well as the non hoi polloi. And um, she uh, somehow was able to cross all lines. I understand a book has been written about her. Yes, by her daughter. Ah, what's the name of it? I think it's Hilda, uh, I, and it's Carolyn Nicholas, who is one was one of the young yes, children yeah, that she yes. brought to D.C. from uh, uh, Virginia when her marriage failed. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly look forward to that book because <laughs> if the book captures Hilda, it it'll be a magnificent yeah, book. Yeah, right. I I actually think that Hilda's and Charlie's stature is such that it will take more years of, of, of passing by before we'll get the real, we can truly um, put together a portrait of them. You know, you need a little distance, and they haven't been dead that long. Well, I tell you what, the city council is giving us ample reason to see <laughs> that there is a difference. There's oh, a distinct gosh. difference between Hilda Mason and what we, we, right. we've operatized at this right. moment. And one, one uh, small measure of that is when I was at Hilda's front desk, uh, she, I had a standing order to let anybody come in who wanted to see her. Um, how different that is today, you try to see your city council member, and unless you're from Pepco or some big uh, corporate uh, entity, you, don't, you, you never get to see your council member, and it'll be two weeks before you'll see a staff member. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that, I mean, we're, we're now, uh, the people are not mm, welcome at the city council. Well, thank God we have Hilda as a model. Yeah. So yeah. We, uh, yeah. we both believe that uh, anything yeah. is possible. 
Yeah. So maybe we can revitalize yeah, Hokkaido no, thinking. That's, that's true. That's really true. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of other um, characteristics of Hilda and Charlie. Um, they loved music. Hilda was uh, one of the strong backers of the DC Youth Orchestra. Mm -hmm. She wanted nurses in the schools. That's and right. She was very strong on that. She wanted children to get medical care attention. Um, she, um, there really wasn't anything that was needed that she didn't support. I mean, they, she were, they also had one other characteristic. Mm -hmm. They strongly believed that spontaneity was a refuge for the un unprepared. They read, they listened to thinkers, they sought advice, sometimes that they didn't agree with, but they wanted to have it all, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that when they came out, they were prepared. Right. And I, 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 I think I'm, I, I admired that very much about mm -hmm. both of them. Mm -hmm. Well, Charlie went to law school, I believe, at the age of 51, mm -hmm. went to Howard, mm -hmm. and uh, then took one lawsuit and, and pursued that for many years. Mm -hmm. And um, so that may be sort of how he had the inside view of law schools and knew what he wanted at UDC as opposed to maybe what he had had in mm -hmm. his own law school. Um, um, I uh, was spoiled. I didn't know how spoiled I was when I worked for her. I thought everybody in the city council was like Hilda. And of course I was way off the mark, way off the mark. Um, now let me see, Lawrence. Both of us are getting up there. We must have some more Speak stories. Speak for yourself, darling. <laughs> Come on, you gotta have some more stories here. Um, did Hilda and you ever cross swords? And um, and then um, <clears throat> one of you backed down and said you were wrong to the other? Because I knew you and you both been in it, in the battle of the district's politics for many years. No, no, no. We, 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 we didn't do mm -hmm. that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hilda always held Fannie Lou Hamer up as a model and mm -hmm. uh, Ella Baker and yeah. Josephine Butler and Septa McClark. I mean, you just don't uh, offer alternatives to those people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she could do it with honesty and, and, and integrity because the, no one could say, yes, you're talking that way, but you're not acting that way. Her, poli her politics was without, without pretense, mm -hmm. without uh, right. any buffoonery. This right. is it. Here's right. where I stand, and here's where I stand. Right. Boom. One of my um, big annoyances when I was on the council was with other staff people who would belittle Hilda. And I wasn't that outspoken as I am now. But what I wanted to say to them is that my member votes right. What's the matter with yours? And they, they were, um, they wanted a lot of fast talking and a lot of jitterbugging and a lot of, I don't know, um, smart, just smart lawyer-like talk, which Hilda did not engage in. But she always voted right. Always voted right, and there was no um, people knew better than to come in her office and try to get her to change her vote. Well, let, let me present the other side yeah. on that. Yeah, conventional politicians are always ill at ease with people who deal with the facts, try to help people, yeah. empower people. So it's it, it, you're mixing two different components, and, and, and we got to always remember that. Right. Hilda basically stood for the proposition that she was there to help people, mm -hmm. and uh, and right. if, if someone wanted to be pedantic, uh, what have, let them go. Right. But when it, I agree with you. When it comes yeah. time to vote, you, you yeah. can always know that she, she was, was an there. inconvenient woman. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. No, I mean, there was no. I remember um, uh, one time, and this gets back to their generosity. Um, we had this lawsuit, and we had a, 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 a matching grant, and we didn't think we were going to get it. Uh -huh. uh, and I went to see Charlie with a girlfriend, and uh, Charlie at that time was, uh, I think, blind from, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. uh, he had this eye disease, but his hearing was fine and his brain was sharp as ever, because he put me through a half hour of sharp questioning, and um, then he turned to his, the young woman who was his assistant, and said, blah, 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 I didn't hear it, and then they folded the check. And then we walked out to the car, and I remember we couldn't wait to get home to open it. We opened the check, and it was for $5,000. And I mean, I almost fainted on the spot. But that, no fuss or must, nothing about, now, I want a report back from you. I want an accounting of the finances. It was like, if they 
liked what you were doing, and they trusted you, it was extraordinary in my, in my experience. You know, and I think what, that sends a tremendous message that these people valued people because of what they had to offer, not what they had to offer to them. Interesting, interesting, mm -hmm. interesting. Well, um, when I would fill out Hilda's uh, engagement book, uh -huh. there wasn't enough space for I'm all her engagements. I'm so it, she had no time for personal life that I, I mean, they would make plans to go to Maine. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it Maine where they had a summer house? Yes. And then they cancel it because something was coming up. Mm -hmm. And as they got older, they definitely needed their vacations. And that was when they would cancel them, cancel them, cancel them. And Hilda, four or five engagements a night. Mm -hmm. um, she and Charlie, as Charlie became older and more feeble, she would not take him. But up until very late in their married life, he always accompanied her. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? That's right. Very much. Yes. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think uh, Charlie was a social butterfly at all. I mean, he would like to be home reading. I, I think we can accuse him of a lot of things. <laughs> yes. Not a social butterfly. Uh, so they were together. Um, I mean, uh, they were a terrific partnership. Um, and she was the front person, and he was sort of like the back person. Mm -hmm. And um, their lives were dedicated to those commitments that they have, and at their, to their own detriment, to their own, uh, um, and so when I say they had no social life, I really mean their social life was their political um, work. I'm very glad we were able to do this, to present to this city Hilda Mason in raw form for consideration, evaluation, and emulation. Mm, yeah, no, I mean, I, her like, both of them, they will not pass this way again, uh, well, I don't think. I don't well, think. maybe not. But, 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 but the very point is, they set such, such a, a perfect standard, ethically yes. and politically yeah. and pragmatically. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That, by God, they did it. Yeah. Why don't, uh, why don't more people do it? Well, as I said earlier, I didn't realize how lucky I was to work for her. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize what a, a political saint she was in a... In, in a uh, although um, she could be very brusque, she was very demanding, she knew what she wanted, and she worked harder than anybody else. You know, and as uh, my husband and I were talking about earlier, I didn't work for them. I ran after them. I mean, I, uh, they were, and I was, uh, what, 40 years younger than they were. I understand. So, <laughs> yes. Understand. So, um, they, they brought um, not only mental sharpness, but... Uh, physical endurance and you know they say that good politicians the thing they've got to have is um, good health and as far as I know they both had good health for many 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 years mm -hmm. until Charlie got glaucoma yeah. and, um, and then Hilda she must have been uh, I think she died in her 90s early 90s and she served until she served uh, she was out of office for maybe half a dozen years mm -hmm. or so and uh, anyway, we're looking for her uh, uh, successor, you know, to come up, be it a he or a she. You know, we want somebody who um, isn't in it for themselves, but as you said, what did you say? She was for empowering, That's right. empowering people. That's, That's what right. we're after. get back to uh, the Masons' extraordinary generosity. Um, when they died, um, I was a little bit taken aback because people did not explain that Charlie and Hilda had been instrumental in so many projects that they had been part of. I, f I felt that that was like a missing bit of their um, history. Uh, and before I ask Lawrence a question about Charles Mason's um, legal scholarship, which was extraordinary, even though he went to law school very late in life uh, and graduated in, you know, uh, on time, I did want to bring up this one example of Hilda's generosity. It wasn't just big issues that she supported. It wasn't just, you know, it didn't have to be something that was uh, currently on the political horizon I, and um, sort of was a sexy you know, issue. 
I went to the hospital uh, with a girlfriend to see Josephine Butler, who was one of the founders of the Statehood Party. And uh, she was always a uh, good person to visit. And she was very ill. And uh, her niece and her great niece came to say hello to Joe. And we were all together in the room. And then Hilda Breeze is in. Uh, and she's looking like uh, uh, an older model. She looks so lovely. She's beautifully dressed. She must be going on to one of her innumerable events. Mm -hmm. And um, while we were busy talking, she pulls the great niece over and says to her, I understand you're going to Russia for three weeks on a student exchange trip. And the young woman said, yes. And she said, now, do you have a heavy winter coat? And she said, no, I don't really. And Hilda said in her most stern <laughs> voice, well, that won't do, or something, something to that effect. So she whips out her checkbook and writes a check for $150 and gives it to her mother, the young girl's mother, and says, get her a um, down coat. She'll never make it in Moscow. And then Hilda sails off. So the point is that she was always, big or little, she was uh, always looking for things to do to make other people's lives more comfortable or e more easy. And now I want to turn to Lawrence and ask him to talk a little bit about uh, Charles Mason's um, uh, legal prowess. Well, he was involved in a lawsuit that became very successful and, and wouldn't have happened had he not financed it. This was a, it was a, a couple, the Allen, the Margaret and Allen McShirley case. They were working in Kentucky the Senate Internal Security Committee invades their house, takes their property, and then begins to publicize it. And not only the, the lawsuit was very successful, it got a ruling against the internal Senate Security, imagine Security Committee, and there was legislation passed to provide money for damages to them. Now, again, now he worked with the Senate for constitutional rights on that, but uh, but for him it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, and I, I think he he would he would have been very proud of that. Right, and he this was not a a one shot effort. This was years. That's I mean, true. Charles Charlie Mason was the most tenacious person I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Would would that be a fair statement? Oh yes. I mean, when he when he got his grip on something, I mean, just like. Uh, he and Hilda deciding that she has to run yet again for the mm -hmm, council mm -hmm. because we have got to save the law school at but UDC. I, I, I think we can trace that back to both of them were always prepared. Mm -hmm. They looked at spontaneity as the refuge for the unprepared. Mm -hmm. And they made a point of all, they wanted to know everything they could about yeah. something before they got involved in it. Right. And that paid off. Right. Um, and even though Hilda and Charlie had access to the finest minds, mm -hmm. legal minds and other mm -hmm. kinds of minds in the city, you weren't put off by that. I mean, they were also very uh, humble, and they could talk to anybody, and they listened to anybody. I mean, I, um, I, I again, I, I, and I'm repeating myself, but I don't know anybody. Uh, I mean, Hilda was the, the gregarious one of the couple, but I don't know of any person of her stature who could traverse so many levels in society, from the humblest to the most, uh, um, I don't know, um, benighted. I testified before the city council often. And when Hilda was there, she would remind me and the audience about the incident that happened in the church. Interesting. Just, I, I, yeah. And I say that simply to show how totally involved she was in that and how comfortable she felt with it, and of course, I would have sent that. Yes, that happened, and, I'm, yeah. and thank you very much. Yeah. But it was I mean, how many other city council people? None could have done something like that. Yeah, yeah, right. Also, um, I can't remember the various incidents, but sometimes I would be in demonstrations where I might be uh, at risk of being arrested. She never said, "Don't do that; you might get arrested." That wasn't in, in her vocabulary. That's right. um, but uh, before we close, I want to uh, say something to Lawrence Giat. Uh, and actually, before I do that, I want to say that um, I, my name is Debbie Hanrahan, and I'm a member of the Statehood uh, Green Party, and very proud to be uh, such, especially with people like Hilda and Charlie Mason as my uh, forebearers in the party. Um, but I want to talk for a second to Lawrence Giat and say 
how lucky he is, and I don't want to cry when I say this, how lucky he is to have been where he was, even though they beat the crap out of him repeatedly because he was such a big guy and he had this reputation and they had to, you know, put him down to break the back of whatever the effort they were trying to uh, achieve, that he can look with a very straight eye, you know, at anybody because he did not flinch. And I think it takes Sorry. enormous... <laughs> No. Sorry. no, no, I think it takes such bravery to do that, to, to not, to, I mean, every, all of us take the easy way out too, many, too often, and how lucky he is, even though they, you know, they, as I say, they beat the crap out of him, that he was steadfast, and I'm just very honored that he's here today, and that we're recording him. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Let, let me just say that my life has been dedicated to the proposition that there is nothing more valuable to humanity than its empowerment. My, all of my politics has been consistent with my religious beliefs. We're told mm. to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those who are bound. It doesn't say check out what the charges are before you go down there. <laughs> and I've lived my life that like that. And I've yeah. followed the example of Hilda Mason, Ella Baker, and others. And I am I, I, I am very humbled by your compliment, and uh, I, I just want to say that I hope that this uh, installment about Hilda will provide an example to all of us to expect more, to do better, and to empower people. Yay. Amen.